The inability to regulate emotions in youth can be particularly debilitating. So I want you to kind of go to that space with me. We're going to leave the fetus alone for a second. When you're making all of the transitions from childhood through adolescence to adulthood, things are changing. The salience of particular social situations and the levity that these interactions carry is shifting more and more the individual is, um, demands are put on the individual to manage their time, to manage their decision making, and really just to become self-reliant. And underneath all of that, the many connections of the brain and its many, and the interrelatedness of different areas is changing. So that's a lot of dynamic change within the brain underlying all of these major transitions in, in life. And so in today's talk, I'm gonna begin by describing two of my studies that have looked at how variation in children's response to stressors is related to how their brains are connected. And then I'm gonna take you into the work that Nathan introduced, which is looking at the development of functional connectivity in the human fetus. So let's start and think a little bit about the children. Um, so the research in my lab does focus both on child development and also this early life fetal development. I want to read this definition. Anxiety is a multi-system response to a perceived threat or danger. It reflects a combination of biochemical changes in the body, personal history, memory, and the social situation. Thus, how we respond to threat involves coordinated responses across multiple systems. And that's the point that I want to get across to you, that really this is the interactions between a lot of areas that underlies the variation that we see at the behavioral level. And I think we're all familiar with the system. This is a system of our body that's at the center of our ability to effectively respond to stressful events. The system is activated by stress. It triggers release of glucocorticoids from the adrenals. These have receptors in areas of the brain, including the hippocampus, frontal cortex, hypothalamus, hippocampus. And importantly, uh, they can also act as transcription factors. And the implication of that point is that they can have lasting effects on how these systems function and how these systems are organized. So given the high level of interaction between regions that regulate emotions, such as the amygdala, the hippocampus, and also are very critical parts of this HPA system, it's almost intuitive that disruptions in either of these systems would have bearing on the other. We know that persistently increased cortisol occurs in some individuals with, de with depression, also in youth, at risk for psychopathology. And we also know that it has an impact on medical outcomes. Now, prior research in adults has shown that variation in cortisol levels during MRI affects um, brain activity and also brain connectivity. But however, these are studies of adults, and very little research has looked at how variation in cortisol response affects neural connectivity in children or in youth. Now, I like to explain to people that children are not just miniature adults. And this is actually a pretty important point for us to think about because the neural systems of the brain actually develop at different rates. So think about that. Take that in for a second. And think about what the implications of that are. So even the systems that underlie the HBA and also these emotion regulation centers themselves develop at different rates. The hippocampus is relatively mature by in the early years, whereas the amygdala and prefrontal regions are still developing well into the second and third decade of life. Now I want you to think about what this might mean. Oh, and first let me just show you a demonstration of this in the literature. This is early work by Jay Geed and colleagues just showing you on the top that the hippocampus by the age of six, relatively flat whereas the amygdala continues past 18 years of age. And this has been demonstrated time and time again, just that there's variability in the rate at which different neural systems mature. And one point that I want you to take from this relative timing of brain maturation is that it will almost certainly have bearing on the responses that we measure in these systems at different points in time. That's the first point. The second point is it probably sets us up for certain times in development when we're particularly vulnerable. And so those are important things to think about. Go back to the picture of the two little cute kids and just think for a second about what this means. It really means that you can't just shrink down adults and look at the same model when you look at development. You really have to think of children as different systems, systems that can inform the way we think conceptually about the mature adult brain, et cetera, but really systems that are developing and have unique relationships that are different. Um, so that's my point. <laughs> 
The unifying approach amongst the research projects that I'll share today is that all query the development of large-scale distributed neural systems using a resting state fMRI approach. I'll first describe two studies in typically developing children, and these address the question, how does individual variation in cortisol response, either during the trier, I'll tell you what that is in a moment, or MRI correspond to changes in functional connectivity. So we first examined how variation in cortisol response to a laboratory stress test was associated with altered functional connectivity in a network called the salience network. This network is so named because it comprises regions of the brain that include the bilateral insula cortices and anterior cingulate that are important for interoceptive and emotional awareness. Regions of this network have also been shown to respond to pain, uncertainty, and other homeostatic challenges. I was asked by somebody I met with today a little bit more about how I think about the salience network. And one thing that I pointed out to that person is that I think that this network is probably like an alerter. It's a system that's probably primed to tell. It's very well connected to other networks. It's probably primed to tell other brain regions how they should respond given a particular salient event in the environment. It's also the person brought up error detection that it's implicated in, which makes sense, right? So it's connected to a lot of other regions. It has to tell you how to respond. Um, so what we did is in the lab, we performed a 12-minute social competence interview followed by a three-minute math drill. Kids are not fond of this. It's super stressful. We collected saliva samples every 15 minutes, so 15, 30, and 45 minutes post-onset of stressor. We looked at cortisol in that saliva. We brought them in approximately two weeks later and performed an MRI scan. It included a lot of different types of images. The one that I'm going to talk about today is the resting state. Plotted here is the mean cortisol for the, for the group with standard error given. The measure that we looked at was area under the curve. Now, if you think about this, we see the typical rise and plateau followed by recovery. This is a very standard cortisol response to a stressor. Um, the reason that we look at this measure is because it's sensitive not only to sort of how much did they ramp up, how high did they go, but also how long did it take them to kind of get back down, because both of those would be indicated by this measure. Now, since we were interested in variability in cortisol responsivity and how it affects connectivity in this particular network, we then conducted a voxel-wise regression analysis with the aim of identifying regions in which network connectivity was significantly related to this cortisol response. For those of you that want a little more detail because maybe you're into neuroimaging and that's really cool and you want to talk about details, we actually performed an ICA analysis of, the resting, of all of the resting state. We did group ICA. Then we used a template matching. This is really only for the people that care about the details. Um, then we used a template matching strategy to identify which of the components was the salience network. And then we performed the regression on the salience network for each subject. So each subject. It's a, it's a pretty standard approach. Um, and what we observed was that participants with higher cortisol response showed significantly higher temporal coupling between regions of the medial prefrontal cortex and the subgenual cingulate, the particularly subgenual cingulate and the salience network. So I'm going to show you what that looks like here. Now, everyone in this room has seen blobs on brains before. You've all seen brain activation pictures. This is not a brain activation picture. To the extent that an area is colored here, that means that that area had significantly greater functional connectivity, was more highly tethered or tied to synchronicity in time to the central tendency of the network. So that sounded like a lot of words, so let me just say it really simply so everyone gets it. These are regions that seem to behave like the salience network in those children that had higher stress responses. So they were more tied into that central tendency of these areas in the kids with a higher stress response. And there were no regions of the brain that showed an inverse significant relationship. And I think that what's interesting about this analysis is it's a whole brain unmasked analysis. We didn't specify that it had to be the medial prefrontal cortex that was significant. And it turns out this is a pretty interesting area of the brain when you start thinking about emotion regulation. So let me explain that to you. Subgenual cingulate is the site of both um, structural and functional alterations in some depressed populations. It's also important for emotional expression in all of us. Um, also, we have a lot of evidence that this is an area that shows altered connectivity in humans and individuals that are depressed, and even in rhesus monkeys. So this study right here was a study of resting state. They saw increased connectivity to this region in adults with major depressive disorder. We see it now in the lab in children that are more reactive under a stressful situation. This is a study in rhesus monkeys, and what Alice and John and colleagues found was that 
across threat conditions in the monkeys, this is a PET study, so positron emission tomography, what they found was that this was an area of higher metabolic activity in those monkeys during the stress. And I'll show you what that looked like. So across stress conditions, greater cortisol response was correlated with more metabolic activity. So across species, across studies, this is an interesting area to have observed this effect. I'm going fast, because I'm gonna tell you about a lot of stuff. So um, feel free to interrupt if you need to, but I realize I'm going a little bit fast. Um, the next study I wanna tell you about um, is I sort of, I did that work and I wanted to know whether also we would see a relationship between cortisol and default mode network. Now one of the reasons I wanted to look at the default mode network is because it's been implicated on a lot of forms of psychopathology, um, but also, interestingly, part of the default mode network let me show you what it looks like, um, involves bilateral hippocampus. So this is some of our early work in children. And this network is a network that's important for self-referential pro processing, mind wandering, projection of oneself in time, self-monitoring and vigilance. I think some of the people in this room know a lot about this network. Um, but it's a very, it's probably the best, it is the best studied and most w widely discussed of the resting state networks. And Again, it's medial prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate precuneus, lateral parietal regions, and importantly for us, the hippocampus, which I told you already, is an important player in the HPA system. Not only that, but individuals that have um, hypercortisol, like an overactive cortisol system, such as um, individuals with post-traumatic stress, have smaller hippocampal volume, and it's thought that this is related to the fact that they have this overexpression of cortisol. So the hippocampus, big player, want to look at how changes in connectivity um, may happen in individuals and in kids that are stressed. Now also, um, there haven't been studies that, so our study before didn't look at cortisol during the MRI and look at functional connectivity. It was like two weeks earlier. So another thing that we wanted to do in this study is we wanted to do it concurrently. We wanted to actually run in the scanner, stick the salivates in their mouth while they were actually in the scanner. Because a lot of people have speculated like, Scanning kids is probably stressful. Yes, I agree. I, I do think it's probably a little bit stressful. It's certainly novel. Novelty ramps up the system. But what I think we're concerned with as experimentalists is, is it so, so variable? Is it changing the responses we're measuring across the group in those kids that are just more stressed out than others? Is it changing our neural measures? So this is kind of the first approach to be in to try to get at that. So we uh, addressed quite a few questions in this uh, study. The first I already told you was we wanted to look at the relationship between this default mode connectivity and how high their cortisol response was to MRI. But we also stressed them out in the lab. So you guys are beginning to think I'm a really nice person, right? Yeah. So we also did the three-year social stress task, which has been adapted for children. It's very similar to the task I described before. Um, we wanted to know how that was related to an MRI scan day, and importantly, they were all scan naive. So these were all, we, we, we mandated that they had to only be children that had never been in an MRI scanner um, because the novelty effect should increase the cortisol response. Um, we also wanted to look at some really well-established self-report measures. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the next thing I'm gonna say. We wanted to look at their distress during the MRI. So we simply asked kids, how do you feel? Give me a rating and I'll show you what that looked like in just a second. And we wanted to know whether they were sort of accurate reporters of their own stress levels based on the cortisol response. And then finally, we looked at some well-established measures of depression, anxiety, and distress, just to see how those maybe were related with the, the kind of reports that we got during MRI. So participants came in for two visits. There was a wide age range here. They performed the social stress test and the MRI resting state on different days. We performed a seed-based connectivity analysis. This is a slightly different approach to doing resting state. We used um, coordinates that we'd previously published as being part of the default mode network. Um, this is just a timeline of what it looks like. I mentioned that they had to tell us how they felt. This is the scale that we gave them. Um, for those of you that work in clinical settings, you've probably seen something like this in hospitals. Um, the thing that you'll note if you are familiar with these faces is that the middle of our scale is actually neutral. And that's not what the clinical faces look like. The clinical faces are actually happy or all sad and there are like nine of them. So we really wanted to anchor this in the, in the um, positive and negative, because it's okay to feel okay, and we wanted to make sure we, had, we were sensitive to that. So basically we told kids which one of these faces best represents how you're feeling now, where one is no fear anxiety at all, three is neither good nor bad, and five is high fear and anxiety. And every time we took a cortisol sample, we also took a VAS rating. 
And the areas of significant connectivity for the default mode included the usual suspects, the same regions I named for you before. This is a very typical looking default mode network at the group level. We then performed a whole brain regression analysis um, and looked at um, what was the most, what were the most significant areas that were differentially connected according to how stressed, according to the cortisol the kids were. And we found that our peak was in the left hippocampus. Um, and I'm just showing you region of interest analyses, zooming into each the right and the left hippocampus. And what you see is that for both the right and the left hippocampus, the more that you had a cortisol response to MRI, to the MRI experience, the more you had connectivity within this default mode network to the, to the bilateral hippocampal regions. Uh, our next analysis was to look at how responses to the VAS scale, so again, that's the happy, sad faces during MRI, were related to established self-report measures. And the one thing I want you to note about this is VAS is asking the kids, how do you feel now? Like you're in an MRI scanner, you've never met me before, how's it going? Right, so it's asking them sort of like the, in this moment, how are you feeling? Whereas these well-established psychometric measures are looking at like, how did you feel two weeks ago, six months ago? So they're more distal to the moment. Um, we didn't know if these would be related, and we found that, in fact, all of these measures were significantly related with children, children's own reports of their distress during MRI, which I found incredibly interesting. And I'll interpret that in a moment. So in summary, uh, endogenous cortisol during MRI is related to neural connectivity. It's also significantly related, and I didn't, have, I didn't show you this data, I cut it out, but their cortisol response to the tree or social stress test in the lab was also correlated with their MRI cortisol, both area under the curve. Their distress during MRI was also significantly related with their actual cortisol measure, so they were good reporters. And then finally, in the slide I just showed you, their, um, these other psychometric measures were also related to their self-report during MRI. So across the two studies, we observed increased functional connectivity in youth with higher cortisol responses. Um, whether we did that concurrently while in the scanner or in the lab, um, we also observed a significant relationship in the cortisol measures over time. I'm sure we're not the first people to show this. It's been seen in different ways, um, but it's the first time it's been shown with regards to an MRI situation. Um, and MRIs are a hot topic, so that seems relevant. Um, also, uh, what I want to suggest is that because this is a sort of consistent measure within the individual, it may potentially contribute to dispositional affect or the tendency of the individual to report positive or negative affect over time. Um, and this is supported by the correspondence we observed between VAS and MRI cortisol as well as VAS and several of the self-report measures of anxiety. And um, what I want to suggest is that um, the fact that we see these increases in connectivity, just sort of a preliminary interpretation of that. Um, these kids are kids that uh, may tend to encounter more stress than your typical cross-section because they live in Detroit, and Detroit's sort of a high-risk urban sample. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about and that we'll be testing is we can, this is a study that's open to enrollment, so our numbers are much higher now than what I'm showing you here is that we may be able to get apart sort of what is the relationship of these many variables. I've shown you many things that are related to each other in children, but how do those vary according to sort of the history and the life events of that particular child, the stress that that child's under? Because what it may, it may be the case that it's advantageous if you're exposed to repeat stressors for you to readily re-engage the system, um, as opposed to the system turns on and it shuts itself down because it gets that negative feedback. So really, those are the kinds of things that we'll begin to take apart with larger samples. So <clears throat> I'm about to wrap up talking about child, child studies, and I'm about to go into fetal studies. But I just want to give you sort of a picture of um, the, the larger picture that I just um, led you to. Because here we're just looking at a couple of things, but we have a really um, terrific uh, resource in Michigan, which is that all infants are given a are, we collect blood spots from all infants since 1986. So all children in my studies that were born in Michigan, we have access through an application process to blood spots from when they were born. We're also doing um, blood draws in the children, and we're also taking blood spots on the same filter paper that the state of Michigan uses. So we have sort of time one, time two, and our plan is to look at methylation and look at gene expression and gene regulation. And so what we want to do is tackle these important questions about how DNA methylation at birth sort of impacts healthy emotional development in children, and we'll do that by looking at endocrine systems, 
neural systems, and overall we do really thorough clinical characterization in our, in our samples. And these ends that you see here is me just kind of counting up with my collaborators, like what analysis are we ready for? So we have different sample sizes of who's had their blood draw and, and who's had the MRI. But overall we have very healthy numbers to begin to make these comparisons. Um, and right now there's only one published study that I know of that has combined epigenetics with neuroimaging, and that was an N of 25, and it was adults. So really, this is an open area for research, and so it's an exciting frontier for us in our work. Um, another thing that we do is we selectively enroll at-risk children, so mostly I've just focused on typical healthy controls today, but we look for children that have depression, anxiety, or a trauma history. Um, again, we get a lot of these in Detroit. We have really good recruitment procedures for our, our kids, and some of the things we want to begin to look at is in children that have been exposed to trauma, how do you end up on this path toward PTSD versus no PTSD? And then of course we have our controls, no trauma, and then how do, how do they vary? So how, are, how do we see functioning different in their um, endocrine and neural systems? And again, we'll look at the epigenetic role. So now let's step back in time to the earliest point in development of these brain networks. Uh, many, many brain dis uh, disorders are thought to arise from disruptions in neural connectivity. It's now been shown across numerous diseases. And important for those of us interested in neurodevelopmental diseases, a lot of these disorders are thought to originate in utero. So it's very important to us to understand how these networks form and what types of events can impact the formation of these networks and their connectivity. So the objectives of the, of the work are therefore to examine how brain networks become formed in utero. We want to compare the development of these networks and fetuses with disease, illnesses, or unwanted exposures during pregnancy in order to determine how the development of neural connections may become disrupted. And the outcomes of this work, in case they're not obvious, is that by identifying these things earlier, we know from a lot, a lot of, a lot of ways that um, early intervention leads to better outcomes. Um, another thing that I like to point out to people that's a little bit more subtle is that by understanding how these networks form and what type of, of events can impact them, we begin to understand the nature of disease, diseases better. And because this paper came out on Wednesday, I've spent a lot of time on the phone with reporters, and I think I was quoted as saying something like, the brain is a tattletale of things that I was trying to explain <laughs> this idea, which of course they wrote down, but that's okay, it makes sense to people. Um, but basically that, you know, by understanding, and I, I sort of use this example with them about if you see a disruption between, and I made up a hypothetical, uh, primary visual regions and regions that are important for um, self-referential processing or something like this, and you see that in a child that's going to have, or a fetus that's going to have autism, then maybe you have this new insight about this disruption between this area. I was kind of trying to explain how we as neuroscientists have a lot of different brain areas, and we can tell psychological stories based on what we see, like the disruption that we see actually tells us something about function that may be altered and that was sort of a new insight to them because they weren't coming from our area. Um, so I just pointed out to you because not only do we want to get at these things early, but by seeing them as they start, as they evolve, we actually may gain new understanding that will actually help us to develop new treatments and therapies. So this is a picture of one of our pregnant scan participants. This is a healthy volunteer. Um, those of you that image the brain will notice that she's going in feet first, and that will shock you. Whoa, how crazy. Um, this is the coil. It's a really soft, lightweight coil. It's very bendable. It's not scary looking. It's kind of like styrofoamy. It weighs about 1.4 pounds, which is so pleasant. It's really a nice piece of hardware because it's, we don't want our ladies to feel uncomfortable in any way. Lots of pillows. Lots of padding. It's not easy to lay down and be still for 45 minutes when you're pregnant on a hard table. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to do something slightly irritating and give some background. But I hear there are a lot of prospective students here today. So this is good. This probably will work out in, in everyone's favor. I'm going to step back and give some background on the method that I've actually been discussing the whole time with you. So that seems a little out of order. But I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page so that when you leave, you really understood what you were looking at. Um, so conventional MRI evaluates brain activity while a person's looking at a stimulus or interacting with a stimulus in some way. So this is the kind of picture that you're used to seeing, like the blobs on the brains. This is my graduate student working on a graphical abstract for, an, for neuroimage. So this journal actually allows you to not write words for your abstract. You can come up with a picture. So this is part of her picture. So I hope you like it. Um, 
So whereas conventional fMRI evaluates activation in response to a stimulus, resting state can be used to measure the strength of functional connections. And the reason that it's able to do that is because regions of the brain that are part of a network actually show spontaneous signals that are matched. So really, it's just the spontaneous signals in the brain that are available to us at all times that we're looking at, and we're looking at how they're correlated with one another. Um, I'll explain a little more, but an, a reason that this is very useful for us with the fetus is that I can't do that with the fetus, right? I can't take the fetus and show it pictures of faces, right? No. So it really lends itself uh, well to studying the fetus, not only because I don't have to deal with presentation of stimuli, but also because it's not necessary. The, the measures that we're using are largely robust to changes in state. So if the fetus is asleep or awake, the brain is still functioning. And that helps us as well. So instead of looking at brain activity and having things light up to a picture, instead we're concerned with how areas are connected to one another. So the brain is made up of lots of different networks, and these have been studied in great detail. You already were exposed to two of them when I talked about the salience and the default mode network. And these networks are basically the way you can think about them is that these networks are constantly circulating signals. So your, it turns out also that a lot of these signals are mirrored in the right and the left side. So your right amygdala is highly, highly functionally connected to your left amygdala. Your primary auditory cortex in the right is very highly connected to your left. We have very, very um, symmetrical signals on both sides of our brain. We also have networks, some of which I've already shown you. So these are communication networks in the human brain. Earlier, we talked about the default mode network of the brain. This is, again, the best described of the networks. And this network is utterly essential to con cognition and also highly reproducible. Our group and others have shown that it's present in children and adolescents. It's also been shown in infants. It's been shown across species, so in monkeys. It's been shown in individuals in a coma. That should shock you. That's pretty amazing. I mean, look at the brain damage, and they still have a default mode network. And recently in the rats, so even the rats. <laughs> and as I stated earlier, there's growing evidence to suggest that altered functional connectivity alters um, neurodevelopmental and neurological trajectories. So altered functional connectivity has been observed in many diseases, but I'm just going to show you some here in the default mode. Schizophrenia, depression, Parkinson's disease, post-traumatic stress disorder, all with altered functional connectivity in this network, also in disorders in children, ADHD, and autism. I'm just showing you a selection. There is a lot of evidence now showing that altered functional connectivity underlies a number of diseases. So we wanted to know first if, well, we're still working on this question, but we want to know if the fetus has a default mode network. And so what we did first is we performed an independent components analysis at the group level with 56 children and fetuses, half and half. And this has the benefit. So there's some benefits to ICA that I probably should skip. But basically, this is the network that we came up with. And it's a pretty good looking default mode network, um, posterior cingulate, bilateral parietal, but kind of a really kind of a puny prefrontal contribution. So this is not my most beautiful default mode network I've seen before. Um, another problem with this is that this came from children and fetuses. So you can't really say, is this really the fetus showing you the default mode network? So what we did then is we took the peaks that came out of this network, and then we performed further analysis um, just in the fetus. And what we wanted to know was, could we find evidence that connectivity within this network that we know children have, that we know adults have, that we know is part of normal, healthy human life, could we show evidence that in the fetus, connectivity between these regions was increasing with advancing fetal age? We would predict that it would. We would predict if this network is developing, the connectivity between the primary regions that are part of the network would be increasing in strength with advancing age. So we performed a seed-based connectivity using peaks that came out of the ICA. We looked at 30 fetuses. On average, and I'm going to talk a little bit about keeping data, throwing away data in a moment. Um, on average, we were able to analyze in the sample 206 frames, which is, um, this is a standard deviation, which is about seven minutes of scan time. And importantly, there was not a significant relationship between frames and age. So if you want to look at an age effect, don't include higher SNR in some of your sample. Signal to noise. It's a bad, bad thing to do. So basically, we try to make sure that whenever we're doing a comparison looking at age, or any parameter, it can't be correlated with the quality of the data that we're analyzing. It's that simple. If you have more frames, 
you have better data. So you have to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we made sure of that. Um, this, this procedure resulted in a default mode network for the sample of fetuses. So now you're looking at all fetal ages. And rather than doing comparing hundreds of thousands of voxels, we just looked at six different comparisons. So we just looked at, just to really reduce the number of comparisons and be incredibly, like here's our a priori predictions, um, we looked at the strength of connectivity between each of these component regions. And what we found was one of these did have a significant increase with age, and that region was the lateral parietal region. So these two showed significantly um, greater connectivity in fetuses that were older at the root level. But you know, we really kind of care a lot about this guy up here, the medial prefrontal, because he's, he's really far away. It must take a really long time to become connected. We'd also really like to see evidence that this is getting, is increasing in connectivity. Um, I'd like to see all of the areas increase, but the way that we can do that is we can perform a regression analysis. So just like we did before with cortisol, we do this with age. And what we find is that when you do that, you do find areas of the medial prefrontal cortex, lateral parietal, and posterior cingulate, all which show this pattern of increased connectivity with increasing fetal age. So we do find preliminary support. I'm going to close the part of my talk that talks about the default mode network in the fetus. I'm going to tell you that this is an active area um, for us in the lab. So we already have shown some evidence that um, connectivity between nodes of the network increase with age, including the medial prefrontal cortex. But really, there's a lot of questions left to ask. And so this is one of the next things that we'll be working on. It is an important network. We'd like to know when we first see it. We'd like to know more about it. This won't be the final study. This is just me showing you our sort of ongoing process as we work on the data. Um, so we want to answer some of these other important questions. So the paper that you introduced um, was an exciting paper for us. This is one of our participants, actually, on the cover. Um, so it was really exciting to not only have the first paper that's able to quantify the development of functional connectivity in the human fetal brain. That's a big landmark for us as a scientific community. But also, they let us have the cover, which was also very cool, I have to say. So that was awesome. Um, and it's because these, these images are really beautiful, I think. Um, now, when you, when you ask me, so we started this project in about a year and a quarter ago, so not so long ago, maybe 15 months ago. And that's pretty fast for time to publication, I'd say. Our, our work's pretty slow sometimes. Some of you are nodding. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this analysis finished uh, quite a while ago, but it was so important to me in terms of my strategy as a scientist to begin with a question, to begin with predictions that were very strong. I wanted to, you can't start studying something with a tool that's never been used to study that thing before and say, what is autism versus no autism? I mean, you just can't do that. You have to start with something where you have very strong prior predictions about what you should observe. So when we went into this study, and I'm going to show you some of the results now, we went in wanting to look at increased connectivity with age. So we had very strong reason to believe that we would measure increases in connectivity strength with advancing fetal age because the networks are forming, the architecture underlying the networks is being built. These are things we know. But we know these things from post-mortem and track tracing studies, very invasive studies. I mean, we want a real life safe way to now look at the development of these networks and have access to that information in life. So would we prove that? Would we prove that we can measure that in utero? We also just wanted to know if we could do it. So there's a lot of like methodological, how good do we do part of this paper. And then finally, we wanted to look at whether we would see regional variability in the strength of connectivity between the right and the left hemisphere. I'll talk a little more about that. So I already told you, we looked at regional uh, differences and also age-related differences. So now, all of you should be thinking, how do you get the fetus to stay still? Well, I don't. I cannot get a fetus to stay still. That would be very cool if I could, but I can't do that. So instead, what we do is we throw away a lot of data. So the question for me as I started, I always knew that um, resting state would be a good thing to try in the fetus. That was something that I planned for a long time. But the question was, how much good data would I actually get, and how good would that data be? And so I'm kind of just showing you a little snapshot of what that looks like. So in 25 cases, on average, we acquired 314 frames, which is about 10 and a half minutes of resting state data. That's a pretty reasonable investment. 
And on average, we were able to retain, after we threw away the high movement frames, about 180, or exactly 184 frames, which is the equivalent of about six minutes, almost exactly six minutes. And I also threw in these other things because I think they're interesting. Um, the number of consecutive frames. So why would you care about consecutive? So I'm talking about how many continuous amount of time could I record the fetus before it took a 90 degree turn to the right? You know, like, I'm not that much. But how much time did I get the, was the fetus still behaviorally? And the answer was one minute, about 70 seconds. And then finally, number of breaks. This is a concept that um, isn't really discussed in the literature yet, but a lot of people use the strategy I'm describing to you. It's actually one of the most commonly used strategies is that you take out your high movement frames and you retain those that are the best. That's a very typical strategy currently. I don't think it's a forever strategy, but it's what we're doing now. And no one's really addressed the question about what that does to the signal that you're measuring, because what you do is you drop a bunch of frames, and then you concatenate, and you take out time cores. But really, these guys ended up being neighbors, and they were never originally neighbors. And no one's really looked empirically at sort of what that does to disturb the data. So it was important to me to report it, so that as we go along in the science and figure out what that introduces, we tried to minimize it in the lab. We tried to not introduce a lot of breaks. I don't want to have, so the average was five. That's quite low. Um, and then this just tells you about our sample. They're a healthy developing sample. And this table is actually, this is an old table. That's funny. This isn't what's in the paper. <laughs> I got more data. I followed all, I got all 25 ladies in the, in the final paper. Um, but basically, they're healthy. They have healthy birth outcomes. Um, it tells you that this is, we follow our fetuses and we make sure that they're healthy. Another thing that we think a lot about is how much movement. So after you did that correction, after you retained that 184 frames, how much data did you get to keep and how much movement was there in it? And you see here the movement values. And these are very reasonable. These are very much within our, our standard norms for movement data. Um, also, importantly, what I'm showing here is that age was not significantly related to movement. That's an important thing. Um, because again, I don't want the parameter that I'm looking at to be related to the quality of my data. So first, this is one of the first analyses uh, that I'm gonna show you the results of. This is an analysis where we're looking at regional variability in terms of strength of connectivity. So this is not considerate of age, this is across the entire sample. And areas that are in green are areas that showed higher connectivity to the contralateral hemisphere. Areas in purple or blue had lower connectivity. And the questions that we wanted to look at is that prior literature had given us reason to believe that we should predict increased connectivity in posterior regions prior to anterior regions and increased connectivity in medial regions prior to lateral regions. And so we looked at those comparisons and we did find a non-significant relationship. It was in the right direction, but non-significant relationship for posterior to anterior, but a significant relationship in medial to lateral. So we did find support for something that has been shown before in the developmental literature. Um, second, I told you we wanted to look at age-related change, and we looked at a number of areas, and I've just plotted a few here. These all have significance of greater than P001. I'm showing you increased connectivity between contralateral regions in each hemisphere with increased gestational age. So proving what I said, again, was something that we absolutely had strong predictions about. This isn't an aha neuroscience developmental moment. No, this has been shown before, but not in healthy developing fetuses using MRI technology. This is very exciting as a new method that we now have available to us. So for the first time, we've quantified resting state functional connectivity in the fetal brain, and we've gained some new insights into uh, development and approach. This just concludes some of what we found. And I'm, I'm not going to go over it. I'm going to sacrifice because um, I talked a lot, so I think you got the point. So now I'm gonna show you some of the things that we're playing with in the fetal data, uh, probably the next kinds of papers that we'll be writing. Um, so graph theoretical analysis is another way to look at connectivity, but this time instead of looking at a particular network or a particular couple of areas that you're interested in how strongly they're connected, you're now thinking of the brain as a whole connectivity network. So you're really thinking of the brain as a network that has network properties and those properties can be dis distilled and described. And it makes these really cool pictures as well. I don't know about you, but I think they're really nice looking pictures. Yes. And the first thing you'll see from an analysis we did looking at 28 children and 28 fetuses is that if you look just at sort of the, um, the well, let me tell you what you're seeing. First of all, areas that are considered modules, 
areas that kind of had similar properties are colored the same, but the colors on the left for the fetuses don't correspond to the colors on the right. And what you'll notice is that the colors in the fetuses don't tend to jump to the other side. So yellow's here and green's over here. Um, you see some crossing here of orange in the visual regions, but like these are not, you know, they're individual colors on the left and the right side. You also see there's not as many lines coming left and right across the brain. All of this is what we would expect because even though I showed you increases in connectivity cross hemispheric with age, it takes time for those to develop. It takes time for those to look like what you would see in children. Um, you see a lot more cross hemisphere connectivity. You also see that these modules cross um, across the midline boundary. Um, yeah, this just talks about the results. Then um, we, re we did this in a different fashion, just looking at young versus older fetuses. This was a group of 28 fetuses between 24 and 38 weeks gestational age. The data I showed you before was also 24 to 38, so that's late second and all of third trimester. And let me not interpret this, but instead show you. So this is data that we've um, submitted for the Human Brain Mapping Conference. And so again, we're looking at young versus older fetuses, and we're asking what are some of the network properties, if you think of the brain as a whole network, that we see with advancing age. And what we see, I've sort of represented here in this table, which is there's um, black, black arrows are non-significant, yellow is a trend, and red are significant. So the principles that we see in development in the fetus is that global efficiency goes up with increasing age, Characteristic path length goes down. Um, this can be explained as the more steps are required between nodes. Nodes are those little dots in terms of communication. So how many nodes do I have to pass through to get from point A to point B? Mean clustering coefficient goes down uh, with advancing age, as does small worldness, modularity, um, and local connectivity. So clustering coefficient basically means you talk a lot to your neighbors, um, and it means that Basically, as you get older, and again, this is a principle that's been described in children as well. As you get older, you kind of prune back some of those local connectivities in favor of those long-range connectivities. This is a principle that we exactly would predict, but again, never measured in the, in the fetal period. Um, so exciting beginning results. Um, now I'm going to share some other future directions. So what I haven't told you is there's a whole lot else that we do besides neuroimaging in the lab. Um, for one, we really characterize these ladies in great detail. I really think of the mom as the environment, and I can't look at the brain just in isolation. I mean, it's great and it's cool, and a lot of people could make their careers there, but I'm very interested in what factors will actually impact outcomes, especially because we are dealing with a high-risk urban population. So we get to know these moms during their pregnancy, and then we follow their infants through phone interviews and in-person lab visits. And people have asked me before, how long are you going to follow them? And my answer is now, I'm going to follow them as long as I can, and then I'm going to follow their children, and then maybe they're, you know, I'd like to follow them infinity if the funding works out for that. Um, so one of the things that we do in the lab, since we are interested in my lab in stress reactivity and stress response, as we bring mom in and baby in at seven months, and we've now seen about 40 of our moms in the, in the lab, um, and we do what's called a double still face. And so, again, if you didn't think I was already a really mean person for stressing out kids in the lab, now you know I also stress out babies and their new moms. It's okay, it's all right, they, they like us. Um, the way the double still face works is really, it's new to me, it's very interesting to me. I'm not an infant mental health specialist. This is a collaboration, this is very interdisciplinary research I'm showing you today. Um, is that the mom sits across from her infant, infant strapped into a, uh, like a high chair. Um, we have cameras both on mom face and infant face and kind of a split screen that we can control the camera angles and all this fancy get up. And basically, uh, mom can play for, f like free play with baby, oh, you're so cute, goo goo, gaga, -ga. and then she has to stop. And she does play for one minute, totally stop. Total no expression, don't respond. So baby's like, hey, over here, mom. You know, like baby's trying to get mom's attention. And finally, baby's probably either really distressed or having parasympathetic or sympathetic type of responses, yawning, spitting up. Those can be kind of a sign of stress. Baby's crying. Or maybe baby's using some adaptive strategies, like I'm going to start playing with this high chair because it's super interesting. Right? It's probably not, but it's a coping strategy. So we see these types of behaviors, and that data will also be coded to learn about how they develop. We also measure cortisol. We also measure DNA. We do cortisol both in mom and in baby. So lots of data coming out of following up these cases. 
So uh, another thing that I, so I told you that the best way that we have presently for dealing with motion is to take out the frames that are high in motion and then just use the rest of them. But that's not really an optimal strategy for a number of reasons, not all of which I think we know. Um, so we are also working with collaborator Colin Studholm to develop more advanced strategies that will allow us to keep moving resting state data. So Colin has pioneered a really brilliant technique. I honestly think you get to see brilliant things once in a while, and this one is actually quite brilliant. So pay attention right now. When you acquire an MRI image, you acquire it in a stack. So you fly through the brain and you really quickly, like in 40 or 60 milliseconds, take one slice, one slice, one slice, one slice, and then you restack them and you say, okay, here's a, here's a volume. It's a three-dimensional picture now. Which means that you're blurry if you look through the slices because you didn't capture every single millimeter. So you're blurry if you look through, but you're really clear in the imaging plane that you image, so flat. Like if it's a plate and you turn it flat, it looks really pretty on the plate, but if you look through the plate, it's kind of fuzzy. And if it's moving and you restack it, well, that's just going to look like a bunch of garbage because the brain's going to look totally not like a brain. So what he does and what we do in our protocol is you fly through the brain in every axis. You fly through sagittal, coronal, and axial. You repeat. So you have six different scans that really are taken quickly because the fetus is not waiting around. You know it can only sit still for one minute because I already told you that. It's a one-minute scan. They can still move. They're allowed to move. Because what his program does is it flexibly restacks the images and it lets them shift according to the fetus movement from slice to slice. So on the, on the multiple tens of milliseconds level. Now how does it work? It's so, it's so great. Is that it actually finds the signature where the two images intersect to correct the reconstruction. Meaning that it's almost like a fingerprint at the point where that axial image goes through that sagittal. Because at that crossing point, you've perfectly sampled that space you can actually put them back together. It's amazing, right? Can I get a head nod? Like, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. All right, thanks for the head nod. So let me thank all my collaborators. This is very, very interdisciplinary work. Um, it wouldn't happen if I wasn't wearing a white coat walking around the hospital all the time. I really do that, I do. And I park in the, phys the, phys the physician parking spaces. I've started doing that, yes, I do. I'm totally not allowed to do that. Um, <laughs> but I spend a lot of time in the hospital, so somehow I feel like I'm entitled. This is my lab, they're amazing, and I thank them, and um, thank you guys for listening. <laughs>